on the lyrical con, never nickel with dumb. Ignore talent, I recite ridiculous rhymes. Now they sleep like a wrinkle with time. Apply the license, but I fly your beheads, a fickleless mind. 33, but I'm still in my prime. Why these nerds turn to herbal, no commercial, no jingle of mine. Support is made, mad, intelligent, I'm inclined to steadily stir like Wimbledon. The skill is divine. Sticking with strippers and chilling with dimes. I'm likely to see some might be with me, girl, I'm single, it's fine. Graphic All right, one to the two, two to the three in the place to be it is the impact lounge impact wrestling review i am your host bq i've also got adam uh no row this week so we're just the yeah, two of us going at it and uh gonna talk some impact wrestling this show is brought to you by the fight app youtube listeners you can click in the description download the fight app create a profile and you'll be supporting the show you do not even have to make a purchase if you don't want to just download the app create a Profile. Big shout out to the Heel Cast. As I've said before, we're not the only ones doing this, talking Impact Wrestling each and every week. So definitely check out my boys, the Heel Cast. They do a really good job. Their show comes out a couple days after ours. So after you listen to our show, you can check out theirs. Impact Wrestling this week. Adam, this was a good show. Yeah, I thought so as well. Really quite enjoyed it. You know, um, most of these shows in the last few weeks have been really, really good. There's, there were some things which I thought were excellent, which I'm sure we'll cover as we go through. But yeah, all in all, really quite enjoyed it. It flew by as well. It seemed like a really quick show. It did. That's when you know you have a good show, when it goes by really fast. And that happened with me too. Uh, about half an hour to go in the show, kind of looked at the clock. It's like, oh my God, it's almost over. So when that happens, you know they delivered a good show. The flow has been really, really nice the last few weeks. The only real dud was the Thanksgiving episode. But other than that, all these tapings from Ottawa have been great. Crowd was great. Um, I really don't want to hear people complaining about the crowd there anymore. Uh, you know, obviously the night after Bound for Glory, you know, not a lot of people showed up. That happened last year as well in the Impact Zone. I've said a thousand times I was there. Smallest crowd I've ever seen in the Impact Zone. So, you know, I don't think the night after pay-per-view is a very good night to tape, but I obviously they have no real choice. Let's uh let's get into this um very little talking this episode, which is nice. Uh I don't mind talking, but I want the talking to mean something, to go somewhere. So, you know, one talking segment a show is fine, and that's kind of what they've been doing lately, so been really happy with that. It kicked off with the number 1 contenders match which was Ali, Sienna, Casey Spinelli, and Madison Rain. I really appreciate it as a fan, the uh, the opening part of the match, the bell rang, and the three heels all attacked the one baby face. They didn't do the, you know, the, the ring around the rosy thing where all four of them are like circling. You know what I'm talking about when they're like circling around, almost like trying to hold hands? I, I know what you mean, yeah. It's good, it's good. You know, that's the way that heels should go, isn't it? That's it. That shows good booking, yeah. This match, it was really good considering I think everyone knew Allie was going to win it. There was no reason for Casey Spinelli or Madison Rain to win. Sienna kind of kind of been there and done that at the moment. Granted, I think she should always be in the title scene. I think she should always be book dominant. Everything. But um, I think we all expected Allie to win the match. Overall, the match was worked really, really well. I think it was better done better than the two three-way matches in the tournament. And it was very nonstop action. Madison Rain is is really looking as good as she's ever looked in the ring. Casey Spinelli's doing a great job. Um, I, I don't have anything negative to say about the match, really. Um, overall, I think some of the negatives I had with the show, and it's very little because I really enjoyed it, was just the way some of the matches ended and who got pinned. and uh, That was my only real issue. Um, it just seemed like, Four of the strongest wrestlers uh, in the company <laughs> all got pinned. So that was just kind of my issue. But this match, overall, I mean, they really did a good job. They, they're they really growing with the Alley character in the ring. People want to see them go see her go back to the cherry bomb. That's not going to happen. Uh, this Alley character is what brought her to the dance. So she's always going to have that kind of element about her. But the in-ring, that's, that's what I'm concerned about in the ring. Is she competing and acting like she can wrestle and in my estimation she's been doing that since slam anniversary so yeah i mean i agree with you on the pin uh, and i think i alluded to it last week on the show that i don't like the way that sienna's been booked since she's dropped the title and it's a bit like how rosemary was booked since when she dropped the title that 
she was like an afterthought. And I don't know why she had the pin here. Madison Rain, all day long, should have taken the pin. Because she's the only one there who's got no real equity to the company going forward. Um, I don't know if it's because her husband's Josh Matthews. She didn't take the pin, but she should have taken the pin there. There, there, there was no reason for any of the others to take it. Apart from that, though, it was really good. And we all knew, as you say, Ali was going to win. I think her booking and her career, sorry, her character development over the last year and a half, however long it's been, has been excellent. One of the best builds I think Impact has done, if not ever done. Um, but personally, she irritates me. She's beginning, starting to, to begin to irritate me now. And I know she's a fan favorite, but I'm getting into that, that Mark category where I'm going to start in my mind booing her mentally because she, she's, she's beginning to annoy me. It's moving too slowly for me. And I think she, for, for a vet, veteran as well, she's a bit sloppy in the ring. She's not always convincing, I don't find. But that's just me. No, fair enough. Um, that running clothesline she does when they're in the corner, I feel like on the indies she's always delivered that a lot better. For some reason on television, that move maybe it has to do with the six-sided ring and the um, the turnbuckles, you know, not being at a ninety-degree angle. I, I don't really know, but that that or it's like a running forearm that she kind of does in the corner um, that comes across really weak sometimes. It, it does look odd. Um, the only one that looked like it, it hurt was. Casey Spinelli, when, when she hit her with it. Yeah. I think she was the third person who hit it, uh, who got hit with it. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it's an odd move. Yeah, it looks like it's very difficult to, I guess the best word I, I could use is to aim <laughs> when you're running and sliding. It looks like it's hard to to, to uh, strike the area you're trying, that you're going for. But, but overall, you know, as I said, Allie was going to win the match. We all knew she was going to win. You know, the, obviously, Gail Kim is kind of pumping her up a little, and... The one baby face is not going to lose in a match with three other heels. That just they just don't do that in wrestling. You know the they're always going to overcome the odds. And again, there was no reason for two of the four women to win. Uh, there was two of the four women who could have easily taken the pin, but for whatever reason, they had Sienna take it. I didn't mind the way the match ended. I, I thought the the uh, the finish they drew up was actually was pretty good. I'm not a huge fan of roll up wins. But at the same time, if we want to pretend like wrestling is kind of real, suspend our disbelief, roll-ups are most likely the way you're going to win a match, <laughs> if we're just being honest, you know? No, no I, I agree, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to complain about it. You know, it is what it is. And in a four-way, I think that's that's sometimes a good way to just keep her, someone looking strong. And, and that's the one good thing about Sienna, you know, she could have won the match if it weren't for uh, Ali sneaking back in and, and, and rolling her up. I think she was about to hit, um, what's her finisher called? The uh, AK-47. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so she was about to hit that, wasn't she? And then that's when uh, Ali came in and, and rolled her up. But no, it was, it was a really good match. And the right person won for the for the storyline to continue. Right. Uh, and, you know, uh, with the ultimate aim, which Ali's going to win the title at some point. And, um, you know, and it will have been a very, very good slow build. But it's getting to that point for me now where it just needs to start you know, progressing a little speed right yeah speeding up a little bit get, get, getting to the punchline i think they have no choice but not to do that so i think when january rolls around i think we may see some acceleration in the alley character that's just strictly speculation but i think it's very possible i'm glad ali starno um bust out the super kick that was her her finisher on the indies so um she wasn't using it because james storm uses it obviously but now she's starting to use it kind of kind of as a setup hold or a setup move uh, so good stuff, and uh, I'm excited to see what's in the future for Casey Spinelli. She's really impressing me in the ring, and it's good to see Madison Rain out there. Uh, hopefully, we get her uh, one more match before the tapings are over. But um, you know, much props to her for kind of coming in. As I've stated several times, I'm pretty sure she's just filling in for Taya Valkyrie at this point. Which uh, I heard a rumor yesterday that she's Taya Valkyrie is pregnant. Wow. Okay. She's so. been uh, she's been Johnny impacted. <laughs> <laughs> she went to Slam City. Sla to Slam Town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah. All right. That, that that well, I was going to say that would be disappointing, but I mean, knowing Impact's run of luck, I mean, that wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it yeah. just wouldn't surprise me at all. <laughs> and and from what I've further further understood, and they've talked about this before, obviously, but that the uh, Red Wedding was in fact supposed to take place in the uh, 
the March tapings coming up, or what is it, January, I'm sorry, January tapings. So that was the plan um, as of the last week I heard, so I don't know how how accurate this is, but very possible she's pregnant, so we're going to have to keep an eye on that. Um, congratulations if they are, but the wrestling fan in me kind of wants to see her get back in the ring. So <laughs> I want to see what this red wedding match is. <laughs> yeah. No one knows for no other reason. Yeah. But uh, it'll be interesting that it's, it's obviously she's not going to wrestle if she's pregnant and certainly not in what I'm guessing would have been a first blood match. Um, uh, I'm guessing if Russo would have been booking it, it would have been a water breaking match now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the way, the way he would spin it, but um... time of the month match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, it, it might benefit Sienna uh, because, as I said, at the moment she seems to be drifting. But with Ali, was probably going well. Will be going into the title picture. Was probably having the title. Uh, you know, Laurel Van Ness uh, asking for her release. So we're guessing that might happen at some point. Um, you know, so I think it might help if Ty doesn't come back. Then they're going to be light on top knockouts and, and she's the obvious one to get back into a storyline because she is drifting at the moment but i think they've really creative have really let her down since she's lost that title because she, she's great she's really good i have to agree with you on that one um huge fan there's a lot more they could do um just to just to book her a little more as a monster and i think uh taking km out of the equation is going to help that in the long run um but yeah i have to agree with you on that I don't know about the UK, but the commercial breaks were extremely long on Pop TV. Uh, I don't know because I, I, I record it and then fast forward it, so okay. I don't really know attention. But there was one thing, and I noticed on the, the, the UK Impact page uh, that someone else brought it up when they were watching it. But did you see the, the lighting go dark and kind of flicker in and out? Well, I don't know if it was a UK problem. But just randomly during the show, you kept on getting like flickering uh, contrast of going darker and then lighter again, as if the color had faded for a few seconds. Was that something that happened in the, the US showing? No, I didn't catch that. Oh, wow. Okay. So it must have been a Spike UK thing. But that, you know, just as you were bringing up the, the adverts, I just thought uh, I, I'd highlight that because it was very weird in the UK watching it. And as I said, you just got this, this flickering of color disappearing. And it was happening, you know, it must have happened about 20 times during the show. Next match of the evening was the X Division Tag Team Match. Caleb Conley and Trevor Lee versus Desmond Xavier and Taji Ishimori. I gotta say, Desmond Xavier has a great theme song. I really like the energy behind that song. And I think he's really going to be a huge star here pretty soon. From what I understand, he's extremely happy to be a part of Impact. He's not, you know, there to just be there. He's really, really happy about it. And uh, freedom that he's uh, allowed when he's there. So... I thought this match was actually really good as well. I think what I appreciated about it was that it was it was a tag team match, but it felt like an X Division match. I thought a lot of the offense Caleb Conley and Trevor Lee showed was a little more resembling of their uh, wrestling ability outside of Impact. I really I liked some of the double team maneuvers. They've been teasing this spike pile driver. Um, they haven't hit it yet. Hopefully that delivers um, when they eventually hit it. But I kind of like this Cult of Lee thing. I'm really disappointed Andrew Everett's not out there, um, that he wasn't at the tapings. Because I did like the dynamic of the three. I didn't like the lazy storytelling where Andrew Everett just kind of inserted himself in there and they just acted like it was all good. So, match really impressed. And at the end, Trevor Lee is pinned by Ishimori. Um, champion pinned. And I, I guess what they were doing here was they were pinning the champions in order to set up title matches for uh, the first show of the new year. So I guess I can kind of understand that. I think the other thing with this one was that Caleb has been pinned virtually every other week. So, um, you know, maybe they just did have to mix it up a bit uh, with the pin. But you're, you're right. You know, it's not so bad because obviously it's going to lead to him having a title match or putting the title on the line against Ishimori or, or Desmond. And someone put me on some knowledge a while ago because I've always, always for years hated champions losing in non-title matches. Well, I hate them in non-title matches for sure, but in tag team matches. And someone had put me up on game where they said, well, a tag team match is not a one-on-one -on -one match. There's other factors involved. There's a partner involved. So when the champion loses, it's not like they lost on their own accord, you know, because there's so many other factors going on in the match. So I can understand that, but... Desmond Xavier, 
has continued to really impress. He really needs to be in this title scene uh, sooner than later, especially with that whole <laughs> Super X Cup thing. I mean, he won the Super X Cup, yet he's the one on the outside looking in as uh, mm. Ishimori is um, the number one contender and uh, apparently got that contendership winning at Bound for Glory against Tyson Dukes. I don't, I don't really know. Um, well, there was also when he tagged up with them and I don't know. They've done a decent job of the storytelling on it. I'm not complaining too much, but it's just I do want to see Desmond Xavier sooner than later in this title picture. I was going to say about the Cult of Lee, if I can just jump in there. I, I, I It's one of my favorite things on the show at the moment. And, you know, they're not getting much promo time, but you can just tell that they work. At, I, I can see them almost being like bad influence at some point in the future. And I wouldn't be surprised if they do end up as a, as a tag team outside of the X division, uh, the two of them. Caleb has been fantastic in his role, just his mannerisms uh, around the ring, you know, and, and some of those kicks on the apron on the outside, but were phenomenal. It, it was, I love the match. It was my favorite match of the night. I thought it was excellent. And uh, my, my little boy came in halfway through it and uh, he's nine and, he saw Ishimori do uh, the like the, the handstand springboard off the ropes and things like that, and he just went, "Wow, he's awesome!" You know, and uh, and he, he is, he's great. You know, um, what a what a star to have in there. You know, the X division is absolutely stacked at the moment. But the, the one thing that they're not doing very well is giving these guys much non wrestling time, uh, and I think that's something that they need to do, especially with someone like Trevor Lee, who's who's just fantastic on the bike. Gosh, looking back a year or two years, whatever, Shane Helms really held him back. I mean, God, in retrospect, you're just like, dude, get that dude off the mic. Let Trevor Lee talk. Now we see what he's really capable of. I agree. Cult of Lee needs some, some promo time, um, backstage stuff. They, they got to do something. The only negative I have on the Cult of Lee right now, because I really like him, is uh, they have no momentum. They, they lose every single time to go out there. Every time. That's something I noticed in the X Division. The heels always lose. The only time the heel wins is if the heel happens to be the champion and the title is on the line. But it feels like it's always, oh, Matt Seidel is going to win and Desmond Xavier is going to win and Nishimori and Sanjay. It just seems like whoever's in that babyface role gets just gets the victory every single time. I'm trying to think, is there any other heels in the X Division that are part of the Cult of Lee? I can't I, think of any. No, not at all. But I, I'm speaking more in the past year or so. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's technically uh, Idris Abraham, but we haven't seen him on TV in forever. I, I really can see them at some point becoming a bit like Bad Influence, and you know, who were two of my favorite, well, two of my favorite guys in, in Impact's history. Um of Kaz and uh, Christopher Daniels. And, and I could really see the two of Caleb and uh, Trevor Lee going into that kind of mold. And I think that's something that, that they need there. Because at the moment, the comedy element's only being taken up by Grado and the Parks, you know, and sometimes it's cringeworthy. Whereas I think Caleb and, and Lee could do something that isn't cringeworthy, but is actually quite funny and entertaining, but still be excellent wrestlers. And I think they will work better as a tag team and have something competitive to offer as opposed to individuals within the X Division because they're not getting any time in the X Division. Next match of the evening was the six-man tag. So when this graphic came out, it was funny because it didn't really dawn on me until they did the backstage segment that El Patron was a heel. Because the whole the whole week that I'd saw, you know, Johnny Impact, El Patron, and um, P.D. Williams... I was just still thinking this is just Alberto El Patron, baby face that came in and then, you know, pushed to the stars. And then when they were doing a segment, I was like, that's right. He's a heel. OK, cool. This adds a, a interesting dynamic. So they took on Eli Drake, Christopher Adonis and their mystery partner who ended up being Congo Kong. So I didn't know who the mystery partner was going to be. I, I wasn't getting my hopes up on something crazy because it's a tape show and we would have known if we would have known if it was something off the charts but i did see the spoiler uh photo because people like to do that online of uh jimmy jacobs with congo kong so when they were talking to jimmy jacobs backstage then i realized where they were going with it i want to say about that first of all i spoke about it with ro when we watched the global force wrestling amped anthology congo kong he felt like a monster he felt like a big deal 
He felt like a very menacing heel. And he had a uh, manager. I don't remember his name off the bat. He kind of had a gimmick where he was a, a, a Las Vegas uh, singer, piano player, talent, some, something like that. Um, I mean, I don't really know how to characterize him. But the, the manager aspect was very helpful to the Congo Khan character. I thought he did some good stuff with Laurel and I thought there was some, you know, they could have done something with KM as a tag team, but his character in wrestling, cause the, cause the big show has ruined, um, how giants are being, being seen in wrestling right now. Uh, maybe not his fault, but the booking of him, um, and, and just being around way too long has, uh, has affected how big guys are seen in wrestling. So Congo Kong, I think a lot of people expected him to be, to be cut this year from the roster and he's still there and I think Jimmy Jacobs is a perfect guy if they're keeping him with him it's like a manager I think it's excellent it's a great idea the overall match itself was uh you know I've, I've stated many times that and I think you have as well that the El Patron Johnny Impact Eli Drake thing just wasn't really doing a whole lot for us and every time they get into the ring in one way shape or form it just seems like we've seen it a hundred times before but I thought this match really delivered as a six-man tag that had a lot of quick action. P.D. Williams played his role very well. He has, you know, slid into this kind of main event scene a little bit as a, you know, de facto main eventer. But he slid in and done an excellent job. Uh, Chris Adonis rarely impresses me, but he, he, he's doing his part. And that, that's worked as well. Congo Kong in this match... I think what I didn't like was him missing that splash off the top rope. You know, if you're, we're trying to build this guy up, I feel like it would have been a good time to kind of have him maybe part of the decision. Um, maybe, you know, squash the, the hometown guy. But they, you know, they did set something up with P.D. Williams and Congo Kong where he carried him out and threw him into the crowd. And obviously those were actors, but at first I thought he really threw them into the crowd. And uh, I remember D ECW years ago, uh, Spike Dudley got thrown into the crowd and then they like carried him off <laughs> crowd surfing. Um, <laughs> so it kind of reminded, kind of reminded me of that. Um, so yeah, I, I like from a creative standpoint, they kind of set something up between the two of them because they were kind of random in the match. What I did not like, and I bet a lot of people agree with me on this one, was just the finish of the match. Eli Drake takes the pin. And it wasn't even that he took the pin, but it was the way he took the starship pain. And then 30 seconds later, you know, still laying in the ring, takes the frog splash and loses. It was it was just the way the finish went down. Like he did he he did not look like the global champion in that finish. But the match itself all the way up to that point was worked really well. Just um, to, going back to the beginning of it where they did the promo beforehand, I, I thought that Alberto has been excellent. I, and I know I'm not talking about his his real life personality and what goes on in his personal life, but I think he's been really good in, in impact, way better than he was, ever was in WWE. And the, the promo beforehand was great. I really liked the, the, the nastiness about him at the moment. It, it, it's a really good heel turn that he's done. And... I've got to say, if there is going to be a title match with Eli Drake, I would rather see Alberto face Eli than Johnny Impact. Uh, you know, I, I think that it's a better match. And although they're both heels, so I don't know how that's going to work uh, from a booking point of view, <laughs> it, Alberto feels like a nasty heel, whereas Eli is like a, a likable heel, <laughs> if that makes sense. Right, right. <laughs> so they do feel like two different types of heel completely different types um but yeah uh, the, the match was was excellent really liked it and the only thing the only criticism exactly as you said you know what why do they have to get eli eating all the pins you know once again that's what chris adonis was in that match for right so you know again they did it to set up you know to to justify El Patron getting a title match i would imagine eli jake will kind of work as the baby face um in that match I think it's pretty obvious, you know, because they said for the first um, impact of 2018, which they've been hyping up very well, um, these guys have a match. I think it's really because this whole feud has just been uh, cookie cutter as hell. Uh, I think it's very obvious Johnny Impact is going to cost El Alberto El Patron the win. Um, 
again making Eli Drake looking like he should have he was going to lose just like Bound for Glory, um, mm-hmm. and then they're going to set up a a three way. I I mean I, I just see that's where it's going. It just I can't see it doing anything different. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. I think that that makes absolutely logical sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, the ma- but the match. I don't want to take anything away from the match because it, it was very well worked. It was just just really didn't care for the finish, but it is what it is. Uh, Chandler Park is backstage with Joseph Park, telling him that he's going to uh, begin his career as a professional wrestler. <laughs> That's going to happen the first impact of January as well. So we talk about you know Ali with the slow the slow burn. Like this is a uh, the exact opposite of that. <laughs> so there, there was one part of this promo that made me laugh, uh, it was, and it's when Joseph Park said, "Yeah, I beat I beat that mid carder bully." Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very well played. Very well played. Because he had said that uh, a few months ago as well, and uh, that that is hilarious. Yeah. I, I, hopefully, it doesn't mean that Bully Ray's coming back. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I love Bully Ray when he was in Aces and Eights, but everything that he's done since then has all been for Bully Ray. He, he just trashes every company he leaves, doesn't he? And he doesn't care. And uh, to bring him back again, I think would be a huge mistake. I think so too. They had the uh, Ring of Honor pay per view last night. Didn't watch it. I, I may watch it um, since it was final battle. I'm, I may watch it, but I saw a a screenshot, and I guess it was like a no holds barred match or something they had, and he was teamed up with Tommy Dreamer, and it's kind of like, oh my god, been there, done that with these two teaming together, and they're pointing at their opponents with kendo sticks. I'm just like, God, dude, like it. It just feels so like we've just been seeing this act for twenty years now. It just just a little tired to me. But. As we're talking about other shows here, there was something I saw online this morning which made me laugh. And going back to the Congo Con match, uh, we've talked about it before. Where I, I found the bit where he, was it Rich, uh, Dick Justice ran into his fist, hilarious. Yes, but I saw, <laughs> I saw an online match yesterday with Joey Ryan, uh, Dick Justice, and McCauley Culkin in a match. <laughs> yeah random i know uh and uh, mccordy culkin did a, a whole home alone bit where they were swinging you know paint cans at, at, at i think it was at hornswoggle um with uh, dick justice then getting the pin but it was just a, a random thing i saw online there you go I'm, I'm gonna have to look that up that sounds random as hell <laughs> but it sounds kind of interesting I'm, I'm gonna have to look yeah. it up for sure anyway sorry i, I sidetracked to say yeah so back to chandler chandler park yeah oh um, yeah yeah, it was quick build, as you say, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's the right thing to do. Let's get him in the ring. What do you think about the three-way Grand Championship match coming up with Matt Seidel, Falabon, EC3? Uh, me, personally, I, I said on Twitter, I haven't even looked at my responses. Um, I think people are tripping on this uh, Grand Championship format. Like, I really don't think it's that big of a deal. I don't think it's that bad. You know, wrestling matches usually have pauses and breaks and Lord knows they have commercials. So for me, the three minute rounds don't bother me even a little bit. Do I think they have to have a solid mid card title? Yeah, absolutely. But the grand championship format doesn't bother me at all. It's just the way that they don't make it important. But I've been calling for quite some time now for them to do a three way match. It could be really good. Or it could be a complete bomb. Yeah. I, I... I mean, I don't know how they're going to do the scoring. That's the only thing. It, you know, it seems a bit weird that, you know, I suppose you could theoretically all of them get one round each, which is what I'm sure will happen. Uh, once again, just an absolutely random side note on, on the participants of this match. My boy thinks Fanabar is brilliant. <laughs> I don't know why. But, you know, one of the, the smallest characters on, well, not smallest physically, but, you know, as in the least presence he's had on the show. But whenever he's on, my boy always comments, he goes, oh, Fanabar's on, that's great. Let's, I want to watch this. And it's, really? Right. <laughs> the one the one fan in the world is my boy. There you go, Fanabar. Yeah, yeah um, that's the guy. But, um. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, um, with regards to the match, it just I just don't think it's been built very well. I really don't. You know, it's it's just there. It, it, you know, and it, and it feels like they're treading water with this at the moment, and they really need to put the belt on someone who's either going to be on telly a lot. And I'm not sure if EC3 has said to them, "Look, I don't want to be on the show defending this belt." I'm not sure what's going on, but that title should be defended every week on TV. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. I have it on pretty good authority. EC3 hates that championship, so 
I could see him dropping it here. I think he wants to drop it. <laughs> I actually kind of like the build. I think it's just been a really slow build. Like we go, you know, a week or two with nothing about it. You know, which which I'm okay. I don't think everything has to be on every show, but you can at least do some kind of backstage segment or, you know, something. It just seems that the three participants are just quite random. Obviously, EC3 is defending it, but why why did EC3 come out and have a go at uh, Matt Sedal in the first place? Okay, he did, fair enough. He has to have a feud, but it just seemed out of nowhere. And the same with Falavar being part of it. You know, that he had a close match with EC3, which is fine. And then he's a judge the next week, and now he's he's in the mix. It, it just all seems, oh, we've got these guys on the roster. They're already in Canada. Uh, let, let, let's put them in a program together for no real reason, you know. <laughs> yeah. Follow Buzz. I'm actually friends with him on Facebook. It's really strange seeing him post speaking in English. Not verbally, not or audibly, but, you know, just, just his Facebook statuses and everything. It's really funny to just see that. And then on TV, him, ba ba. I just hope that if he wins the title, he just gets, you know, five minutes on the mic and just cuts an absolutely fluent, perfect English promo, you know, with, with, a, with, a, with a real uh, aristocrat, uh, aristoc- I can't say it, uh, regal voice, you know, really posh. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? Just completely <laughs> break character. Or, or just, just Hulk Hogan style, let me tell you something, Jeremy <laughs> Borash. <laughs> yeah. That would be awesome. Eat your anyway, rice. Yeah. Do you think that he's got any chance of winning this title? No, I think uh, Matt Seidel is going to win it. Yeah, well. I okay. Think... I think we can both agree that it's definitely not going to be EC3. No, definitely uh, no definitely... way. Yeah. He needs to get out of, of, of away from that belt in the mid card. Uh, you know, I'd like to see him um, have a proper feud with the I Drake because I know they, they kind of had a mini feud last year, but I really would like to see that come back to the full so Absolutely. he needs to get back in the title picture yeah. and i'm not saying he should win it i'm not saying he should win the title off eli but i think that 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 that's maybe what they should have done whilst impact and alberto are feuding because eli drake hasn't really been involved in that feud he's just on the side and he's <laughs> yes he, he's just he's a supporting character in the main event feud and he's the title holder it's it's crazy it, that's exactly what it feels like you nailed that james storm and moose call out american top team Moose kicks off by saying, American Top Team is really starting to piss me off. Like, they weren't pissing you off since a month or two before Bound for Glory. And obviously they pissed you off a little bit because you went and trashed their facilities and they whooped your ass and King Mo cold cocked you. Like, uh, I, I thought this was one of Moose's better promos in a while. Don't get me wrong. Uh... But he needs some he needs some work on the mic before he can really be in that main event scene. A talker would help him greatly. In Ring of Honor, he had you know Stokey Hathaway, I believe. Uh, he does okay, but James Storm is so superior to him talking that it's kind of like Moose is just a side act. You know, he says what he has to say, and then it's like, okay, what's James Storm have to say? But mm-hmm. Moose Moose kind of went to the, he he kind of went to the well a little bit too much about trying to you know bitch and you could you always say. Like, bitch is a word you use when you need cheap heat. Um, that's something I remember when I used to watch the E that Roman Reigns, you know, putting people to sleep. And then all of a sudden, you just say, bitch. And, oh, uh, you know, it's like something you just kind of kind of got to use when you're losing a crowd. Eddie Edwards is the one that came up with the bitch boy Bobby thing. And he doesn't get any kind of credit for it whatsoever. I don't, also don't think Eddie Edwards did a good job of trying to get that over. It's like he just kind of brought it to the table. And now... Moose took it and ran with it and made it his. But James Storm's promo, very good. Um, American Top Team comes out. And Dan Lambert, uh, masterful once again. Talking. He's great, isn't he? You oh can watch gosh. him for two hours. You can put him on the beginning of the show. and just to, He would be good on commentary. I, I know he's obviously got his proper job, I'm guessing, running a ATT. But he, he would be great on commentary. Oh, my God. Wrestling just doesn't have a good heel color commentator in any promotion right now and there's some you know there's some guys out there i don't remember what his name is the the nxt guy that got injured or i forgot it Corey graves there's a lot of people oh he's the best heel commentator like i think he fucking sucks i think Mm -hmm. i think every heel commentator in every company sucks and uh i kind of liked where josh was going with it and then josh is now back to being kind of a tweener and then kind of a baby face like there was a 
just just on commentary when they were showing the uh, when Gail Kim won the knockouts title and they were showing uh, the Road Warriors and TNA and everything. Man, what a difference in commentate commentary. Granted, I'm sure the crowd size and volume plays a big role, but what a difference! Oh my god. We talked about this the other week, didn't we? Uh, and I was saying, you know, I, I, Don West for me is is the best impact or TNA commentator, and I don't know why they don't get him back because I'm, I'm guessing he's got good relationships because he, he still does the uh, the basement sale, doesn't he, or whatever it's called, uh, every now and again the promos of that. So does he not want to do it? Maybe I don't know, but he brings so much passion to it. I like Don West. Yeah, I think we have to make a change to the booth next year, but. I mean, they, they already made a change of the booth, and I wasn't really big on the Pope and Josh Matthews. I was, I've always liked Josh Matthews. Um, I don't think he's, you know, the best in the world, like he says, but I do like him. I was never, I didn't really like the uh, him, him and the Pope and their their chemistry. Never, never <laughs> really cared for it. But going back, but yes, if Dan Lambert was on color commentary, oh my god, would be insane. Um, but going back to that, uh, to the promo here. They they said we knew this was coming. They built up this whole loser leaves town angle. That's going to be James Storm versus um, Dan, Dan Lambert. Lambert. Dan Lambert pinned him last week. We know Dan Lambert is going to pin him again next week, or uh, you know the not next week, but in a few weeks. They made it a no holds barred match, with they always, which is what they always do when someone can't wrestle in the match when, when there's someone who's not a wrestler. So I think this is going to do a good job overall of getting Dan Lambert <laughs> really getting him over as a heel. But where is it all going? If Lashley ends up leaving, where is this all going? I don't think anybody knows. I feel like they're just kind of taking it day by day and going to kind of see what happens. Well, it looks like uh, KM is going to be their guy going forward, you know, because obviously he came in and saved him there. So I think he's going to play a part in this going forward. So if Lashley does indeed leave then KM is going to be the, the representative of ATT. But here's what I want to say about KM. When KM came in the ring, and he now he's you know got the leather jacket and he's not wearing the bright colors and everything, so he's looking a little more menacing. He came in the ring, he, he made the save, and I'm like, okay, this is cool. This is the start of a new direction for KM. And then within 10 seconds, he ended up flat on his ass. And then it just felt like, the the old KM again, you know, like like it it was a complete different feel, and then it took us right back to what we know. It was, it, you know, that you build something up and then it's just gone in a second, and it, it reminded well, it didn't remind me of it, but just when you were talking about it, then it was like when Crimson lost his streak in, in like thirty seconds in the end. Uh, I don't even remember that. I think it was James Storm, funny enough, who finished him there as well, uh, returning James Storm. So yeah, it, it just seems a waste that you've put all this effort into building a new version of this and he could have really you know that could have been the kickstart of him there's yeah. no reason why james storm had to stand tall at the end of that segment none no reason at all i would imagine km is going to play a big role in that match with dan lambert and james storm but if that's going to be the case they should have just kept them off tv this time around yeah absolutely all, all they should have said that um or, or, or even have KM stand in for Dan Lambert, you know, so it's a one-on-one a -on -one match or something like that. And, and, you know, Dan Lambert could have built it and said, look, you know, you're going to fight KM instead of me. And this is how you prove yourself. You're going to be worthy to be an at and You've got to beat Storm. Uh, and that would have helped with that storyline because you'd have got heat as well then for beat, being the guy to beat Storm as opposed to some, I'm guessing, some cheap victory uh, that Dan Lambert's going to pick up somehow. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see how they're going to do this. Um this is exactly, in a sense, how I thought James Storm should have went out. I said this about a year ago. I've been saying for a long time, and this guy is my top three wrestlers right now in Impact. But I've said, if I, you know, I'm being real with you guys, he's not going to resign at the end of the year, or the company's not going to bring him back. I knew that that was going to happen, happen. But I always said he should have went out, putting someone over. Um, like if if it would have been a career versus career match with EC3. That would have really capped off, you know, that feud instead of just kind of get, getting rid of it. It would have really capped off that feud. It would have made EC3 huge as a heel. So they could have really used this to get get a heel over. Um, but they're choosing Dan Lambert instead, which they are getting a heel over. But the only difference is we don't know 
the future America top team, American top team in Impact, Lashley in Impact, Lambert in Impact. We don't know where that's going. One thing about the promo, if I can just jump in there, is <laughs> Dan Lambert really is so masterful and so storm mind. Um, it made me laugh when he kept on saying poo poo. Um, it was childish, but it did make me laugh. Um, but it was just Dan Lambert kept on interjecting, you know, and that was working the crowd. He just gets it. You know, there's a few guys who just get it on, on the mic. And Dan Lambert has been brilliant. He's been really excellent in this. And he even did a good got, good job getting that cheap heat, um, taking a shot at the uh, the local ho- hockey team, the Ottawa Senators. So, <laughs> yeah. always slam the uh, the hometown team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, main event time: uh, the knockouts title match, Laurel Van Ness versus Rosemary. This whole angle and everything was just ruined once we knew Laurel wanted out of the company. The Knockouts Championship Tournament was something at first. Okay, cool, this is going to be awesome. And then by the next week, we knew we know she wants out. And because of that, it was very much spoiled that she had won the uh, Knockouts mm. Championship. And anytime, you know, obviously I don't do spoilers here, so anytime I talked about Laurel on the YouTube channel, I disabled the comments uh, so people didn't get in there and talk, well, she's going to be a knockout champion. Because there's some people who don't know. You know, shouts out to my brother. He just watches the Impact product every week, doesn't go online, doesn't nothing, you know. So I always have to be very careful with him because he listens. Um, but there's a lot of people out there like that. They just turn on the TV and watch. I was like that with wrestling, period, until I started podcasting, really. I didn't I didn't get online at all. When I got online, I was looking up um, basketball and and uh things like that. I've, I've never, until I became a podcaster, Googled wrestling in any way whatsoever. Um, didn't really follow the social media accounts. I, I seriously just, I, there was a point I used to watch every company. Um, I just turned on the TV and watched it. So I try to uh, protect the people who do that. Um, Can I just say something? I bet you enjoyed it more back then as well. I really did. Yeah. I, re- I really, really did. Um, it never bothered me. Uh like when I watch the E and people are like, oh, SmackDown's taped. I'm like, who the fuck cares? Like it never bothered me. I didn't understand why people hated that so much. But then I realized, okay, well, there's people who get on and read spoilers, things like that. I, I just never did that. I've always lived in the moment with wrestling. Um, did that with TNA as well. And I always knew they taped a bunch. NXT taped a bunch. ROH taped a bunch. Never cared. Just, I just sat down and watched it. Uh, so... Yeah, unfortunately, being so heavy in social media for this podcast ruins so much for me. But um, Laurel Van Ness, yeah, Laurel Van Mess, Laurel Van Yes. Uh, this match was excellent. One of the best one-on-one knockout matches we've had in a mm-hmm. long time, and it it was kind of like this was what could have been. I mean, this was a feud that could have been because it was done so well and. I was watching it. I'm like, this is probably the third match in three years where Laurel had an actual match. So when she debuted and was daddy's girl and everything, she she did a good job. But she never she was kind of squashing wrestlers. Like she was wrestling in squash matches. She wasn't really competing. And then mm-hmm. um, the whole bride thing happened, um, and she they could have ran. They still could have ran with her as a competitor, but instead she was getting squashed. You know, last time she wrestled Rosemary, she was in the dress, and Rosemary beat her in three minutes. Um, and then, you know, fast forward here, six months later, <laughs> they're having a uh, competitive match. And it sucks, because Laurel's probably one of the best female wrestlers in the world, and we didn't get to really enjoy that a whole lot. You know, this is really the first time in a while we really got to see her work um, with this whole t- knockouts title tournament in general. This is we really got to... Um, enjoy her but i really think it just it, it it took the wind out of my sails just knowing okay in january she's gonna drop the title and leave the company um so that's that's something that kind of sucks but but the match was really really good um i thought that though i i think they overdo it with the mist with rosemary but the way that they did the the finish was really good i always thought the unprettier was a very dangerous move to take and especially being caught up in the top rope it was a, a fantastic finish to the match. I'll, yeah. I'll be honest with you. You know that that is a way that you should win the title. You know, with with a proper, not a roll up or something like that. That was a good finish. And I, I said to you before, I don't like that move because it's so awkward to set up. 
but it worked from the top rope. You know, it didn't feel awkward in the way she hit it. So uh, good props to them on that. It was a, it was a good, good finish. Yeah, excellent finish. When they were showing uh, Gail Kim earlier when she won, I always thought that finish was so flat. Um, I mean, there was there was so much heat in the building that it didn't really come off flat. But if that finish were to happen in an impact ring right now, it would be the flattest finish of all time. So, no, the awesome job with that. Um, what I'd understand was when Laurel pushed the referee down at the at the very end when she was, um, you know, Rosemary was on the top rope. She technically should have got disqualified, <laughs> just <laughs> tossing him to the ground. He's only 12. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> he's the youngest ref I've ever seen in a match. But there you go. It, it's funny, like, a female just tossing a guy to the ground like that. Like, my wife couldn't toss me to the ground like that. I'm sure she could bring me to my knees fairly easily if she wanted to. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she pull, pulls no punches. But, I mean, just tossing someone like that, like they're a piece of garbage. Uh but you're saying about you know obviously being disqualified for pushing him over, which yeah, if, if you're going by the rules. But then again, when when you think that Rosemary still uses the miss as a baby face, it, it's a pretty heelish thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. Um. So, but once again, my boy was transfixed by this. How did she get that green mist? Where did that come from? Okay, so <laughs> I'll explain later, son. <laughs> but um, they, they've done that, getting it on your hands and rubbing it in her eyes a few times now. I, I wish they wouldn't go to that well so often. Because it, it does seem like if Rosemary's going to lose, it's because of the mist. Yeah. that's Sorry. They already kind of went to that well at Slammiversary with Sienna. Um, this was better done, much better done. Um, but, yeah, they, they just got to give the, the mist a break a little bit <laughs> with her. Um, and then Laurel, I mean, uh, not Laurel, but Ali is the number one contender. So it looks like we're going to get Ali versus Laurel and... This should be interesting because these are two girls who spent majority of their majority of their impact career not really wrestling and not really competing seriously. So, this is going to be really interesting. Is that big pop a pump in the background, I can hear? Oh my god, yeah. There, there is always a uh, fire truck running around here. It's, it's crazy. I record out in my office, which is like the way that um, houses here in Illinois are built. A lot of the time is that there's the front door, but then there's like a uh, sunroom in front of the front door mm -hmm. um, that, you know, people use as an audience, I mean, an office or a junk room or whatever. But there's always like a door you got to enter before you get to the front door. So that's where I record. But it's starting to get so cold here now because this room is freezing. Mm -hmm. I need to uh, I need to ro relocate here sp soon, especially with these fire trucks. I have to I edit these out as best that I can ever show. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> yeah, no. All right, so it sounds like a uh, big pump of pump has left. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, they'll allow me to press forward with this. Uh, and I don't live on the street at all. It's just, you know, it's it's happening in, in the distance, but they're so loud, obviously, that always come over the mic. But oh, but yeah, let's get back to this. Um, just, I I really have nothing negative to say. Uh, otherwise than, than uh, maybe some of the little minor things we pointed out. But this this was really good. I was just so disappointed that we're, you know, we're starting to get some development with this Laurel thing, and and she's going to be gone. Um, you never know what, what could happen. Maybe um, maybe she does decide to stay, but she really she really ruined this whole uh, tournament. And, uh, and she probably didn't do it on purpose, obviously, but... I, th I think she hurt hurt the company a lot. She's been overly promoting Impact on Twitter now. It's it's kind of like they were okay. We're gonna let you go, but make sure you promote. So she's like retweeting everything, like just taking it a little overboard. But it just it just sucks. She she's definitely a talent, and it's a shame that she's gone. You know, um, because I think that there was a lot of uh, potential in the character and the title run and the matchups because because she's barely wrestled so she there's lots of fresh ma matchups that she could have had so it's a real shame i think the company kind of did her a disservice um to a point because what we were talking about in the last you know last several podcasts was that you know the last set of tapings she didn't wrestle she was in the crowd doing silly shit so I can see where she was like, okay, I'm, I'm not happy with this. 
and then the next tape set of tapings roll rolls around and she's like okay i want to leave um and i think that's something where she they probably didn't communicate with her very well like hey this you know 2018 is going to be a big year for you we're going to do this and this you know so maybe maybe the company um has to take some blame here i wonder because there's no doubt in my mind that she received a a WWE offer on the low, no doubt in my mind. But I wonder if this is a gimmick she takes with her because this is something she, you know, now they own the intellectual property. This is a gimmick starting to like kind of really take off, and she uses it on the indies a lot. And um, I don't see it working there. So, you know, maybe she's rolling the dice on being the a, a plain Laurel Van, a uh, plain Chelsea Green character. I don't know, but. I don't know. I, I'm not going to beat a dead horse here. It just it just sucks. I think it really ruined things and made the knockouts title look like it's not that important. It, I mean, who wins the title and they say, okay, I want to leave. And this is this has been a problem the last couple years. Hardys were the champions and they and they left. Drew Galloway was a champion and left. Bobby Roode was a champion and left. Eric Young was a champion and left. You know, this has happened a lot. We get the uh, sit down between Sammy Callahan and Conan, or the Summit, as they called it, as uh, being the heads of OBE and LAX. And I thought this was freaking badass. It wasn't something I was really looking forward to. I thought they were just going to be in the ring sitting there. And I've said it a lot that promos like this are, are done so much better when they're backstage or they're outside of the ring. Uh, that's that's a big Vince Russo thing. Get get out of the arena and. Uh, I always feel like they lose so much, uh, so much of its uh, power when it's when it's done in the ring. So I wasn't expecting this. It uh, exceeded my expectations way better than I, 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 I could have imagined. The acting was really good. What do you got on this? Yeah, once again, Rinso, Rinso, <laughs> Vince Russo, I should say. Uh, you know his his theory of as you say going outside the ring. I actually quite like a lot of Russo's ideas. Uh, I don't like him as a person when I've heard him speak, but uh, I'm not saying this was Russo's doing, but I'm just, as you brought him up, I wanted to point that out, that I am a, a Russo mark for some reason. Uh, but anyway, yeah, with regards to this, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, everything from the lighting, it almost looked like a horror film, the way it was all set up. And uh, I, I've said all along, I love the outstage stuff when it's more uh, cinematic feel to it. It just makes it feel more... Uh, something that you want to see more of and you know it, it draws you in whereas as you say when it's in the ring it doesn't it just feels like some hammy acting when it's in the ring um the, the only thing i don't like ab uh, about this segment is i just don't understand what they're fighting over when it comes to the territory you know we're, we're going to move in your territory we're going to uh, move some merchandise or whatever it is i mean i i, I that, that always bothers me about LAX and, you know, what is their business? You know, they want the tag team titles, but, uh, you know, is that just a, a sideline? What else are they doing? You know, we're going to close down your tattoo parlors and things. OK, uh, so they're running a protection racket, selling drugs. It, it annoys me, that thing. I wish it, you know, they could come up with something clearer as to what LAX are doing. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing that bothers me. And they did the whole thing and it was they basically just set up the a tag team title match. Like I thought it was going to lead towards like the bar barbed wire match where OVE's like, okay, it's going to be our rules this time. Maybe they did say something like that. I didn't, I didn't catch it. it just sound like they just set up a tag team title match. Yeah, it was a, well, and LAX had to disband if they lost. So just after having one James Storm putting his career on the line, LAX were putting their careers on the line 20 minutes later, which was a bit annoying, but at the same time, I can understand, you know, that's the kind of thing OVE would do, obviously. But yeah, Overall, I thought it was brilliant. I really liked it. It was just a shame that those two stipulations came so close to each other. Could you um, could you imagine what it would do to the tag team division of LAX Lost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You have to bring back Dick Justice and uh, Grado as a tag team. Uh, right, exactly. Um, yeah. So, um, it, oh, uh, by the way, that's not a spoiler because I don't. I, I genuinely don't know who wins, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, guess, I'm guessing they're not going to lose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I thought the segment was very good, and uh, the although there was some uh, dime store magic, uh, you know, with the flame throwing at Conan, which I didn't quite understand why Sammy Callahan could control fire now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but obviously he can; he has control of the elements. Apart from that bit, which was a bit silly because he could have just punched him and had the same effect. Um, it was still very, very well done, and the two of them 
is the best I've seen both of them do in impact with regards to a segment. You know, they both came over as menacing. They both came over as as uh, just, you know, really, really edgy characters. And it was fantastically done. Really good. And Sammy Callahan has further shown how much his charisma has saved OVE. I mean, obviously OVE could have not, not done that segment. I mean, he has taken that team to the next level. I, I can't believe I'm, can't believe I'm saying that because I, I, for the longest time I was like I'm just not feeling these guys. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, even their look has changed uh, since he's come in. You know that now they tend to not wear that stupid one-armed unitard underneath the hoodie look, which I, I never got. Um, you know they they just look badass now, and uh, the only thing is I still don't know what they stand for uh, again, other than Ohio versus everything. Um, but yeah, it, it's good. And do you know it reminds me of it, it's it is almost like a gang war kind of thing. But with LAX being, I don't know, like a Latino gang and uh, OV being more of a like an Irish street hoods, you know, uh, if you think back to, to like movies. But it's it very good. Two different tough gangs coming at it from different things. And I, I just thought overall it ended the show really, really nicely. Although I know we, we, we've talked about it before. It would be nice to have a champion, you know, winning the belt, holding up the belt and ending on that image for, for Laura Van Ness. Um, but, but, you know, I'm not going to complain about that too much because it, it was a really strong, solid end to the show. Yeah. It was just a great show overall, but just, just, to, you know, hammer that point again a little bit. It really shows how much confidence they have in someone to close a show. You know, they're only willing to do it with Lashley and American Top Team. And there's only like a few people they're willing to close the show with. But in in retrospect, you know, looking back, yeah, this probably was a, the right way to close the show. Because um, they left us with kind of a cliffhanger. But, and maybe that's, maybe that's what they're going for. Maybe that's, you know, we sit here and say, oh, they don't want, they don't want to close the, the, the show with this guy or that guy or this girl, that girl. Maybe it's because they're, um, they're trying to go for the cliffhanger effect. Yeah, that that works to some extent, and I think that's a good way of doing it. But it doesn't help that then it's three weeks time, you know. So a cliffhanger should be next week. I can't wait to tune in. But uh, and I know because of Christmas you can't do that. But you know, it, you know what I'm saying is that if you're going to have a cliffhanger where you have got people really buying into this, really excited, then it has to be done at a time when you're going to see it next week. You don't have to wait three weeks. But anyway, that's that's a minor gripe again. Yeah, true, true, true. All right, so that'll do it for us this week. Talking Impact, uh, excellent episode. Very, very good. Um, lowest ratings in uh, company history here in the United States, unfortunately. And uh, that really sucks, but the show was was really good. So we'll be taking the next couple weeks off while they're doing best of 2017 shows. And uh, we will talk to you guys again in 2018. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs>